Good evening. Welcome to Peace. Welcome to our Good Friday Tenebrae service. Uh, this really is a good Friday, even though we're going to talk about some sad things that happened to someone we love so dearly, our Savior Jesus. We also realize that it was his love for us that he willingly went through this for us. And so we're going to talk about uh, Jesus' last hours on the cross. We're going to take a look at Jesus' seven statements that he made from the cross, uh, the prophecies about those in the scriptures, and how uh, Jesus fulfilled that when he was on the cross. So that we have absolutely no doubt this was God's plan from all of eternity, and Jesus fulfilled it. It's a good Friday because this means we're forgiven. So tonight is a tenebrae service. It's a Latin word that means darkness or shadows. And so just an explanation of a few things tonight. Uh, First of all, with shadows and darkness, gradually as we go through the words of Jesus, the sanctuary will be darkened. And the reason for that isn't uh, to try to get this atmosphere of a funeral or anything, but we know that when Jesus died on the cross, the, the earth went completely dark for three hours as creation groaned to see its Savior, to see its Creator die. And so uh, it's a somber occasion. We, we recognize the magnitude of our sin. That's another picture of the darkness. Um, so that's going to be one thing that we see here. Um, one of the things that we're going to have toward the end of the service, you'll see it in the bulletin, it's another Latin word called strepitus. It's, uh, it's basically a loud noise after all the darkness that reminds us that the, the Jesus tomb was broken open and he will rise. And so... Um, after we are in darkness for a little while, uh, please don't be too alarmed when uh, there's, a, there's a loud noise at the end. So. But it's in the bulletin, so you're prepared for that as well. So I think that's everything we need to know. Uh, our service is in the service folder. It's also on the screen. Uh, maybe with it being darkened, it's easier to follow on the screen, but you're welcome to follow how, how you would like. Let's begin our worship this evening by singing our first song, The Lamb.
God most holy, look with mercy on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, be given over into the hands of the wicked, and suffer death upon the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'd like to have a brief meditation on a portion of God's Word, a portion of the history of what happened on Good Friday, taken from uh, Matthew 27. This is the account of Jesus before Pontius Pilate, and um, there's a choice to be made. Two men, Barabbas or Jesus. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So, when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that he had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What, is he, what crime has he committed? He asked, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The word of the Lord. So here it is, Friday night, and I almost feel like I'm keeping my tradition. My tradition at home is the family gets home on Friday, have a little bit of supper, we crash on the couch from a from exhausting week, and then we watch Dateline. Relaxing, right? To watch a show that's about <coughs> crime and thrill and suspense, usually about murder, but that, that's what we do. We watch Dateline. And I say that here we are on a Friday night, and it feels like I'm keeping the tradition because what I just read kind of sounds similar to a Dateline episode. As I was reading that text, I could almost hear that reporter Keith Morrison kind of introducing the episode. Tonight, two men whose lives are forever entangled, standing in the crosshairs of the prosecution, their lives on the line. Who would be freed? Who would be sentenced? There's a twist that no one can guess. Tonight on Dateline. You know, it, I know it's silly. I know it's silly. But there is a sense to that in this scene that we just read about. I don't, know if, I don't know if I've ever thought about this before studying this text this week or if you've ever thought about this, but there are a lot of really ironic similarities between the two men that Matthew introduced us to. You've got two men named Jesus. Do you realize that? In another of the Gospels, Barabbas is... He was named Jesus as well, Jesus Barabbas. So you've got Jesus Barabbas and you've got Jesus of Nazareth. Even the name Barabbas is kind of ironic because it literally means son of the father. So Barabbas is son of the father. Jesus of Nazareth is son of the father. You've got both of these men in the custody of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. 
And you've got both men accused of the exact same thing. Insurrection, subverting the people. That's why I say it kind of sounds like this, this Dateline plot. Because if you, if you just read this section carefully, often we don't because we want to get to the, to the part where Jesus is crucified, right? But if we, if we read this carefully, there's a lot to really glean from this. How is it going to end for each Jesus? I really think this comes alive if you take a look at it from Barabbas' perspective. Everybody, from the crowd to Pilate to Barabbas himself, knew that he was guilty. It was obviously, he had been caught red-handed. I have this sense that the The families of his murdered victims were probably there demanding justice, just like today. Because of that, I imagine him sitting in his jail cell every day thinking about what's going to happen to him. But to be honest, it was a foregone conclusion, right? Because I think you know enough about Rome and the Romans to know that they weren't just going to sit here and, and just take a rebellious threat. No, he was done. It was over for Barabbas. He had no hope. His execution by crucifixion was just a matter of time. And so I picture Barabbas sitting in his jail cell every day hearing another prisoner taken out, hearing them scream as they're beaten and flogged, maybe hearing pounding off in the distance as hammers nailed another person to a cross. Just waiting. And it seemed like this Friday morning was the day. What did Barabbas hear from his cell? This rage-filled crowd, right? Crucify! Crucify! And then what did he hear? He heard a guard marching down the row right to his cell. He was marched out and then up and then blinded by the morning sun and there he was, the full volume of the crowd screaming at him. Here's the crowd, here's Pilate and he's right in the middle. He's over. But what happened next could really only be categorized under the file of truth is stranger than fiction, right? Because as soon as he steps forward, The crowd yells his name, Barabbas, Barabbas, give us Barabbas, as though he's some kind of hero. And then suddenly his chains are loosed, and he's free. But if you think that is the twist to this whole scene, keep watching. Because now... All of the attention turns to the other son of the father, Jesus of Nazareth. What was going to happen to him? All of a sudden, the crowd roars even louder, even more full of rage. Crucify him! Crucify him! Even though everybody, the crowd, for sure Pilate, and even Barabbas knew that he was innocent. He had done nothing. Then it all happened really quickly. There was a washing of hands. Jesus was led away. He was beaten, flogged to near death, and then forced to carry his own cross to his execution. I want you to just think about maybe what was going through Barabbas' mind at that time. For all these days, he knew that that was the sentence he was going to get, right? That was the, the punishment that he knew he deserved. That was the cross that he was supposed to be carrying. That was the death that justice was going to serve him. Just pause and ponder that for a second. The guilt, the shame, the curse, the death that Barabbas deserved. All of that belonged to Jesus now. 
the release, the freedom, the life that Jesus rightfully deserved belonged to Barabbas. It's the greatest exchange ever, and it happened this day in history. And that's why we call this Good Friday, isn't it? Because that is the gospel. The Bible tells us God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what Good Friday is all about. God made the innocent guilty so that the guilty could go innocent. If you really think about it then, you and I, we are Barabbas, right? We're guilty sinners and we know it. We're in a spiritual prison. We are bound, helpless. We, we know the sentence we deserve. We're on the death row of death rows, just waiting for God's righteous judgment. And then this day, Jesus steps in. Jesus, n- not, hear me well, not a victim, not some tragic historical figure, but Jesus willingly steps in to our place. He's in control of all these events of history that we're going to see tonight. And so he takes the accusation. He assumes the guilt. He absorbs the shame. He carries the cross. He's rejected by God. Everything that you and I deserve, Jesus got. But please understand what this means. You and I get what Jesus deserves. All of the love and the forgiveness and the innocence and the acceptance and the glory that God can give, it's ours. It's the greatest exchange in the history of the world. I will admit that for the longest time in my life, I didn't like this section, this whole exchange this whole uh, account of Jesus and Barabbas. I couldn't stand the fact that the crowd could look at a man like Barabbas, obviously guilty of the worst things, and they, they chose him. I couldn't stand the fact that there standing before them was the most loving, most innocent man of all of history, and they rejected him. I always wanted to just step in the crowd and say, what are you doing? No, Jesus, give us Jesus. But as understandable as those emotions are, that's wrong. I I don't want that to happen. Right? Give us Barabbas. That is truly the cry of our salvation. Give us Barabbas and be rejected, Jesus, by all, by God the Father, so that we can be called sons of the Father. Go to the cross, please, Jesus, so that we can go free. And we shout that because we know that Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to do this. That was his plan for all of eternity. That's why this is, this is really good Friday. Thank you, Jesus. We now focus the rest of our service on the statements from Jesus' cross. Just again, an explanation that it's really neat to see that these statements were actually prophesied in Scripture, in the Old and the New Testament in various times, and we can see that Jesus fulfilled them, and we can be absolutely sure that our sins are forgiven. surrounding a pack of 
villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. He bore the sin of many and made intercession. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Gracious Savior, you, you did not strike back with revenge against your enemies as they ridiculed and crucified you, but prayed for their forgiveness. In your compassion, pardon us for our secret sins and sins we do not discern, and enlighten us to know and do your will. Amen. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise.
Mighty Redeemer, remember us as we walk through the darkest valleys of life and realize that our time on earth is ending. Stay close to us when we feel the pain and loneliness of dying and take away our fears with your certain promise of paradise. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Precious Jesus, you consider us friends and care about the needs of our bodies and souls. Keep us in your care as we walk the road of life and provide the blessings we need to gain safety, contentment, and joy in your service. Amen.
From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Lord Jesus, you endured the horrific penalty of our sins as your Father turned his face from you on the cross. Compel us to see in your sacrifice the dreadful nature of sin and call us to acknowledge the amazing depth of your love. Overcome our shame, dear Savior, and give us grateful faith. Amen. After this, when he knew that all things necessary for the scripture to be fulfilled had now been accomplished, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Dear Jesus, as our brother on earth, you endured the agony of pain that besieged your body when, you, when your sacrifice was complete. Knowing our experiences, hover over us with your care and compassion when our bodies and hearts are hurting. Provide us with strength that we may confess you with confidence and power.
When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Gracious Redeemer, you paid the full price for our redemption and have released us forever from the hold of Satan, the power of sin, and the fear of death. Protect us from the devil's claim that we need to do more and from the accusation of our consciences that we have not done enough. Lead us to place our entire confidence in you and to live our lives secure in your grace. Amen.
It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Forsook, nor will a smile of fool. Thus David once in anguish spoke, and thus our dying Lord. Though it's your chief delight to dwell among your praising saints, and yet you hear us groan as well, and pity our I waste my breath, my hand 
has brought me down beneath the bitter dust of death. And then he gave his spirit up to trust it in your hand. His dying flesh reposed in hope to rise at your command. Dearest Lord Jesus, you gave your life for the salvation of the world and you rested in the tomb as the soldiers kept vigil. May we also keep vigil as we remember your Sabbath rest in the tomb. We know that this all ends with your glorious triumph, your victory over sin and death. But for now, we wait quietly. As we keep vigil, Awaiting the celebration of your resurrection, fill us with hope. Help us to look forward to the celebration of your resurrection and also to look forward to the hope of our own new life that you won for us. Amen. You may stay to meditate and reflect as long as you'd like. And then when you are ready, go in peace, dear brothers and sisters. It is finished. <laughs>